the book of Job. Number two, what is the point of the book of Job? What is the point of the book of Jonah? And then number three, how does the book of Jonah speak to us today? How does the book of Jonah speak to us today? So number one, what do we need to know before understanding the book of Jonah? Number two, what is the point of the book of Jonah? Number three, how does the book of Jonah speak to us today? So, if you're opened up to Jonah 4, let's read now from the Word of God. This is the anonymous narrator writing in regards to Nineveh just being saved. Verse 1 starts, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please. Take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die, and said, For it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Let's pray. Our Father, as we look into this final chapter of the book of Jonah, Lord, I pray that you would enlighten us. Lord, just as we just sung, refine us by your fire. Lord, use your spirit to uh, weed out anything that uh, shouldn't be in us and to teach us what it means to be more like you, what it means to have your heart. So Lord, enlighten us this morning. Help us to look into your word and come up refreshed, renewed, or with a new conviction. I pray all this in your son's name. Amen. So our first question for this morning is, what do we need to know before understanding the book of Job? What do we need to know? What are the tools that we need to give us the proper lens to read this book? And I'm just going to give you the answer right off the bat. In order to better understand the book of Jonah, we need to know two things. History and genre. History and genre. The first tool in our toolkit is history. Specifically, we need to know the history of Jonah. Who is this guy? Now, when I hear the word history, I shudder. I'm not a history buff. I don't like to study history. Um, but don't worry, there isn't much of it. If you were to scour the entire Old Testament for the name of Jonah, outside of the book of Jonah itself, you'd only find one instance. And that instance is in 2 Kings chapter 14. And there it talks about how Jonah, the son of Amittai, was the prophet advisor to Jeroboam II. Jeroboam II was the king of the northern kingdom of Israel at a time when Israel was divided with the kingdom of Israel to the north and the kingdom of Judah to the south. And by the advice of Judah as the prophet advisor, it says that according to the word of God, Jeroboam II was able to have things like military success, political victories, and he was even able to restore Israel's borders to what they used to be. So, in short, 
King Jeroboam II, he brought a lot of honor to the northern kingdom through his successes. So a lot of historians would award the most prosperous reign of the northern kingdom's entire history to this king, King Jeroboam II. And as a result, the prophet advisor Jonah was considered a very popular prophet. After all, it was his advice to the king that led to this prosperous reign. So that's the first thing we need to keep in mind as we read through this book of Jonah. The typical Jewish reader would have read Jonah's name, they would have seen it at the beginning of this book of Jonah, and immediately have these thoughts of praise, of, of adoration, of veneration. The second tool we need to better understand the book of Jonah is genre. What kind of writing is the book of Jonah? And there's been a lot of debate over the years as to what the genre of Jonah is. I mean, is it, is it fiction? Is it history? Is it only loosely based on history? Is it myth or fable? Or is it maybe a parody or even a parable? What about the tone? Is it serious? Is it lighthearted? Is there humor involved? What is the genre? Well, to save you from a long excursus on the pros and cons of each one of these theories, which I would love to do, uh, here is my quick take. And please understand this is my personal interpretation of the genre. I encourage you to study it if, on your own if you are unconvinced or if you're doubtful. Uh, but my take on the book of Jonah, which is more or less the take that most scholars and commentators land on, is that the book of Jonah is satire. It's satire, or at least it contains satirical elements. Think the Canterbury Tales, or Monty Python, or the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis. Some modern day, modern day satires include Saturday Night Live, The Simpsons, and even our friendly neighborhood internet memes. Those are all forms of satire. Satire is a genre that could, it could be fictitious, it could be based on history, but that's not the point of satire. The, the purpose of satire is to critique something. It's to make a statement. The author is trying to critique something that he finds absolutely unacceptable. Something in society, or maybe something in an institution, or in an, an individual, or maybe an activity that he finds unacceptable. And this critique is done using tools like wit, humor, and irony. So in the book of Jonah, we see things like exaggerations or hyperboles. So the point where it becomes absolute absurdity. I mean, we see a giant fish swallow a man. A little absurd there. We see a plant in this chapter able to fully grow, fully mature, and wither within the span of a single day. We see a Jewish man in chapter 3 who preaches in Hebrew to a city, this foreign city that speaks Assyrian, and somehow they're all able to understand. Maybe there was a translator, I don't know. Another Example of absurdity, sheep and cattle cry out to God in repentance. And in fact, the book concludes with a phrase that reminds us of the cattle, which is where I get the title of my sermon from, and also much cattle. These are all absurd episodes, used sometimes for humor, used sometimes to make the reader pause and think. <coughs> What also happens in satire, other than hyperbole and exaggeration, is irony. Irony happens. What one would expect of certain characters, what they would expect them to do, or how they would behave, it doesn't happen. In fact, most of the time, the exact opposite happens. Where we would expect a bunch of pagan sailors or this whole pagan city of Nineveh to stick their own polytheistic group of gods. Instead, they all end up rejecting their gods and turning in repentance to the God of Israel, without question. 
where we would expect a popular prophet of Israel to obey God and be enthusiastic about saving the lives of the lost. Instead, he runs away from his mission, and here in chapter 4, he even laments over the fact that Nineveh has been saved. And actually, if you scan through the whole book, he's never even called a prophet. In Jonah, we find that both the unexpected and the absurd happens. And that's because the author is using satire. He's using irony to catch readers off guard. Where history would tell them one thing, where history would say that Jonah is celebrated as this successful prophet, this satire tells you the complete opposite. And the author is doing this to expose something that isn't right, that he feels should be changed. He's using satire to get his point across. Which brings us to our second question for this morning. Now that we have a proper overview of the history and the genre behind the book of Jonah, our second question is, what is the point of the book of Jonah? What is the point of the book of Jonah? Why did the author write this book? What is the critique that he's trying to make through satire? And I believe chapter 4 is the key to answering that. So let's read again from chapter 4. And actually, let's pick up from chapter 3, the last verse in chapter 3, just to get the context. It says, When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. But it displeased John exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O oh, Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Chapter 4 of Jonah uh, begins to give us this glimpse into the mind and the heart of Jonah. Until now, it was never explained why Jonah fled and why he was so reluctant to fulfill his mission. But here, after Nineveh repents and God relents, it says in verse 1 that Jonah becomes very displeased and angry. He's in utter shock at how all of the Ninevites have seemed to turn to God and avoided their disaster. Because he was expecting the half-hearted sermon that he had given to have zero effect on him. He was expecting Nineveh to just continue to be the evil people that they were known to be, and that they would eventually be completely destroyed by God. But that doesn't happen. Instead, Nineveh repents. And that's why we find Jonah in utter dismay. And in verse 2, he goes on to tell God, Oh Lord, is, it, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Basically, he's saying, God, I told you this would happen. In fact, that's why I fled in the first place. And then he gets to his reason. Here it is, the reason for Jonah's disobedience. At the end of verse 2, it says, For I knew that you were a gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. This whole time, Jonah knew the character of God. He knew that God was a God that was full of compassion, full of grace, full of mercy, and that God was ready to change his mind about punishment. And there was a part of Jonah's heart and that just wasn't okay with it. He wasn't okay that God was so ready to relent. And that's why he ends his prayer with this dramatic, God, just let me die. Kill me, please. I think part of the reason why Jonah isn't okay with God being such a benevolent God is because even though Jonah knows the character of God and he has the right theology, he has misplaced motives which is a scary thing. You can have right theology with wrong motives. And Jonah doesn't want God's character to pull through because deep down he didn't want Nineveh to be saved. 
And I began to explore that idea last week, but if you take a scan throughout the book of Jonah, the narrator gives hints here and there that Jonah doesn't want to see non-Israelites saved. I mentioned last week that when Jonah suggested to the sailors that they should throw him overboard in order for them to be saved, he was essentially saying, I'd rather die than fulfill my mission and preach to them. I'd rather die than do that. And when he does preach in the, to the city of Nineveh in chapter 3, his message is super vague. It's only five words long. He doesn't, he, he doesn't mention God at all. And he also doesn't mention any instructions for what Nineveh could possibly do to escape destruction. He doesn't give any of that information. And it seems like he doesn't want Nineveh to be saved. His motives are off. And there are some other hints as well that Jonah is against saving these Ninevites and non-Israelites. And Jonah's response to the sailors in chapter 1, verse 9, he says, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord. The sentence structure there actually puts emphasis on the words Hebrew and Lord. Lord being the personal Hebraic name of God, Yahweh. What he's saying is, Hebrew I am, and Yahweh I worship. He's taking pride in the fact that he's Hebrew, and he worships Yahweh, the one true God, not one of the pagan gods. And then when we find Jonah and the fish in chapter 2, his prayer, it seems like a very righteous prayer. Except for the fact that the focus of his prayer is completely self-centered on Jonah. He says, I called, I cried, I said, I went down, I remember, I will sacrifice, I have vowed, I will pay. He's focused on himself. And then he says something very curious at the end of his prayer. In chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, he says, Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. He's saying in verse 8, those pagan idol worshippers, the ones with empty faith, they don't deserve your love. They don't deserve the love of God. Their faith is empty in the idols, and they get nothing for that. They don't deserve to be saved, but, but me? I'm better than that. I'm better than the pagans because I worship the God who saves. I worship Yahweh. Again, he's got correct theology. Everything he says about God is true, but it's mixed with this sinful prejudice. And that's why instead of there being a neutral word for bringing Jonah back onto dry land, the narrator makes it very clear, very apparent, that the fish vomits Jonah back onto dry land. The action of the fish reveals the reaction that God has to Jonah's superficial, nauseating, vomit-inducing prayer. All of this to say that the author is using irony and satire to reveal that at the core of Jonah's actions is this deep underlying prejudice against those who are different from him, those who aren't Israelite. And back in chapter 4, the text takes a turn after this prayer of Jonah's. God begins to direct his attention to Jonah, to personally minister to him, to personally respond to him, to dialogue with him. Read again in chapter 4, beginning in verse 4. It says, And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? Jonah went out of the city and sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what should become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant, so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, 
And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity you? That great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left. And, by the way, also much cattle. Where Jonah's prayer in the first three verses of this chapter reveal what's deeply seated in Jonah's heart, the rest of the chapter reveals what's deep in the heart of God and why God did what he did throughout the story. We get this quick one-day episode where Jonah is sitting outside of Nineveh, and God causes a plant to grow, to shade him. And as a result, Jonah switches from being utterly upset about Nineveh to being overly joy about the plant. But overnight, God also sends a worm to attack the plant. And with the addition of the oppressive weather, Jonah again becomes angry and wishes to die. And it's in response to this extreme shift of emotions that God reveals his reasons for saving Nineveh. First, God makes a point about how Jonah didn't do anything to make the plant grow. He didn't work for it, he didn't water it or, or labor for it. It was all God. And the plant represents humanity. The plant represents humans. Jonah has no say in whether people get to live or die. It's up to God. God alone gets to judge the fate of people. The second thing that God points out here is that Jonah is so delighted in the life of the plant and so angry with the death of the plant. Yet he fails to delight in the renewed life of the Ninevites and instead is angry that they didn't die. His emotions are completely misplaced. Jonah cared so much about this single plant, and yet he cared so little for a city that not only had hundreds of thousands of lost souls, but also much cattle. And this brings us finally to the answer to our question, what is the point of the book of Jonah? What is the point? Why does the writer want to point uh, want to use satire. What is the critique he's trying to make? The point of Jonah is this. God desires to save all of humanity. God desires to save all of humanity. God cares enough about Jonah to personally dialogue with him, to give him an object lesson through the planet, and to give him an explanation in the end for everything. He doesn't give up on Jonah because he desires to save him from what's internally wrong with him. And in the same way, God doesn't just care for Jonah, he also cares for the city of Nineveh in this story. He sought to bring them to a place of repentance, albeit through a really bad sermon, delivered by a reluctant prophet. And what happens is Nineveh turns away from their violent and evil ways and turns toward God in repentance. Just as God didn't give up on Jonah, God doesn't give up on Nineveh because he desires to save Nineveh from what's internally wrong with their violence and evil ways. And just as Jonah cared so much about the plants which matured and died in a fleeting day, God cares for all people, whether they're a prophet or a pagan, whether they're Hebrew or Syrian, Israelite or Gentile, God doesn't differentiate between humans. He desires to save all of humans. Because our lives as humans, like that of the plant, is ultimately fleeting. Human life could be here today and then not tomorrow. So the point of the book of Jonah is that God desires to save all of humanity. And that brings us to our final question. Our final question for this morning is, how does this book of Jonah speak into our lives today? How does this speak 
into our lives today? What difference does it make for us here today that God desires to save all of humanity? Well, the book of Jonah serves as a warning to the church. And so the answer to how the book of Jonah speaks to us today is this. The gospel isn't meant to be kept from others. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not meant to be kept from others. Remember that the book of Jonah is satire. There's a criticism being made here about Jonah. The criticism is that Jonah has the truth about God. He holds the truth that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Yet Jonah, his prejudice against Nineveh and non-Israelites keeps him from wanting to share that truth about God to other people. And if you remember from last week, Jonah represents the nation of Israel in this story. So the author ultimately is critiquing something that's endemic in Israel. Something is wrong with all of Israel. Israel was initially chosen by God to be his chosen people. They were God's faith community. And they were the ones who knew the one true God. They knew him by name as Yahweh. But they were never supposed to keep the secret of Yahweh to themselves. They were chosen by God as his people to be a witness, to share with the rest of the world, to all the other nations, this mystery of who the God of creation was, who Yahweh was. But that's not what happened. If you survey the entire Old Testament, Israel keeps on running into this problem that they choose to keep the secret of God to themselves. They refuse to share God with the nations. So the critique here is that Israel is not sharing God. Where Jonah represents Israel, if you remember, Israel represents the church today. So the same goes for us, but instead it's a warning for us as we read this. The warning here is that the church of Christ holds the secret of the gospel. We now have what's called, the New Testament calls the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we hold this mystery, but this mystery is not the type that's meant to be kept hidden. This is a secret that is meant to be revealed. It's meant to go out to all people. The gospel is not meant to be kept from others. And maybe we're like Job. Maybe we have a prejudice. Maybe we have uh, something that's even ethnically motivated like Job. Or maybe it's not ethnically motivated. Maybe there's someone that we have in mind. Maybe someone in our workplace. Or someone at school. Maybe it's that certain family. Someone that we feel like they don't deserve to know the love of God. They don't deserve to know the good news of the gospel. They don't deserve to be a part of our ministry. Maybe it's someone you just find difficult to work with. Or maybe you just avoid them because of their personality. Maybe you find them annoying. As sinful, as prideful people, it's easy for us, even as Christians, to create barriers and not share the gospel with certain people. But God desires to save all people. And maybe it's the people that we find most difficult to be around, or the people that we would rather not talk to, or the people we think uh, shouldn't be here in the church, perhaps it's those very people that God is calling you to witness to. Maybe there's a reason God has placed them in your life, because the gospel isn't meant to be kept from others. As we close in a few moments, I'd like for us to spend some time actually in prayer. And I'd like to do this exercise, just a personal time of prayer. So I invite us all to bow our heads. And as we spend time in personal prayer, I'd like for us to maybe think of, you know, who is God calling you to share Christ with? Who are the people that God has placed in your life that you haven't yet shared the gospel with? Maybe they don't even know you're Christian. 
Some of us might need to spend some time confessing to God. Are there barriers that you've put up that you need to break down? Ask God for help to do that. Are there some prejudices or maybe fears that are keeping you from being an effective witness of the gospel? Confess them to God. Lay them at his feet and ask him to help you to overcome them. Some others of us here might not be Christian, and you might be sitting there thinking, well, this is kind of weird, I've never prayed before. Uh, but actually, you too, as a non-Christian, have a calling. It's where we get the word vocation from. And the Bible teaches that in creation, every person has been called to work in a way that creatively contributes to the common good of the world. So if you're not used to prayer, maybe consider you know, how your vocation contributes positively for the good of others. Is there anything that's keeping you from doing that? Is there anything that's keeping you from being more impactful with your work or your studies? What are the things that are keeping us from doing the thing that we know God wants us to do? Or maybe some of us are Christians and we realize that we don't have anyone to share the gospel with because everyone around us is Christian. Well, I think there is a problem there too. Because God does not intend to have the good news of His Son just kept amongst those who already know Jesus. So maybe ask God to place people in your lives or to open your eyes to those around you who don't yet know who Jesus is. Maybe it's someone you interact with at a coffee shop or in the grocery store. Maybe it's a coworker. Maybe it's a friend. Who are the people in your life that God is specifically calling you to share Christ with? Well, I'll give us a few moments and then I'll close us in prayer. <coughs> Father God, Lord, I thank you for being a God who, who didn't keep the secret of your Son from this world. Lord, you didn't keep him from coming down onto earth to save us, to, to live a perfect life and to, to die for us. And Lord, you sought us out. You didn't give up on us, even when we were lost, even when we were enemies and really didn't deserve your love. <clears throat> But Lord, you've given us the secret of your Son. And as a church, we hold the truth of the gospel in our hands. And Lord, help us to be a church that effectively uses that secret to bring others to know about it. Help us to share with those that maybe you've placed in our lives and we feel like, I just don't want to spend time with this person, talking to them, sharing about my faith with them. Lord, help us to break down barriers. Help us to overcome our fears. Give us the courage and words that we need when we don't know what to say to be able to share effectively who your son is and the love that he showed to us. And Lord, I myself have to confess that I have thought of people that I would rather not do ministry with, that I would rather not have in my small group or in my, in my ministry group or fellowship, people that I would rather avoid. Lord, help me to deal with my prejudices, to understand that at the root of it is sinfulness, my, my own sin. And Lord, help me to change. And help each person here to do the same. 
that we would become a church that is not afraid of sharing the gospel with others. And Lord, because you're a God who desires to save all people, help us to reflect that same character in our heart, that we would have that same patience that you have with us, that we would have that same mercy and grace with others, Lord. So Father, help us to become more like you. And by not keeping this secret to ourselves, help us to be a church that is a voice for the gospel. I pray in your son's name. Amen. Amen.